Very good. Glad to be here with you folks. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Going to uh, run through a brief background on bedded confinement buildings. And uh, there are going to be a lot of details I miss, I'm sure, but uh, we'll try to get an introduction to it and then see where the chat leads us from there. Uh, start with a, a question, you know, why are we even considering uh, bedded beef confinement? Uh, well, confinement systems may offer some advantages over open lots, performance advantages for the cattle, and certainly one of the primary reasons is that the confinement building keeps the water away from the manure, which uh, has several advantages. So uh, we all know what happens with open lots when you get rainfall on the open lots or snow melt. Uh, we have water coming out of the pens, and that water is not very clean. And uh, depending on where that water goes, it can be a problem to deal with. Uh, so by using the confinement buildings, we can get away from things like this. Uh, it's uh, very small in the corner of the picture, but if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll notice that this picture was actually taken by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And when you've got an open lot and the Department of Natural Resources has a photo like this of your lot, uh, things are not good. And uh, those of you who live in the countryside know that uh, when you have a row of trees like that on the left, it's very likely that on the other side of that row of trees, is uh, probably a stream. So uh, just in the way of definitions, what are we talking about when we say confinement for beef? Uh, I'm referring to confinement buildings where the animals are completely or essentially under roof. Uh, there may be very small outside access, but essentially under roof, and the animals do not have continuous access to unroofed areas. Uh, those definitions become important if you're looking at cost share and things like that, where there may be regulatory definitions or at least standards definitions that you have to follow. So a confinement beef building may look something like this, where the animals are completely under roof, and they stay under there with the possible exception of moving around for working and cleaning the building, as opposed to an open lot with a shed, where we still have the building there, but they also have free access to outside pen space all the time. Uh, so that's the distinction I'm making here. When we look at bedded beef confinement, uh, we are considering that in a confinement building, uh, no discharge of that manure is allowed. So we're not going to let any water run away from these buildings. In Iowa, that's the legal definition for confinement, uh, is that no discharge of manure is allowed. This is uh, in comparison to open feedlots, where depending on the size, uh, you may need total containment of that runoff water uh, if it was coming from a feedlot over a thousand head, certainly. And in Iowa, if they're under a thousand head, you still have to settle solids and make sure that the water you discharge doesn't cause problems elsewhere. When we look at uh, the way these buildings are sized, typically Midwest Plan Service recommends 40 square feet per head for bedded confinement buildings, although I hear producers talk about a range anywhere from 28 to as much as 50 square feet per head. Uh, observing those buildings, I still think I'm most comfortable with the Midwest Plan Service recommendation and having at least 40 square feet per head in the bedded confinement building. This is as opposed to a slatted floor building where you may be uh, putting those animals in at as little as 25 square feet per head. So the bedded buildings are larger in footprint than the slatted floor confinement buildings. We generally see people use roughly a foot of fence line feed bunk per head in the building, although people will go anywhere from 9 to 14 inches. And I would say a, a recommended clear height inside the building of at least 12 to 14 feet would be a good recommendation. You want some air space above the animals to make the management of that air quality much easier and also to allow equipment access through the building. The primary consideration on these uh, is that we're trying to alter the environment for the animals. So we want to allow for good summer and winter ventilation. So typically, you'll see these buildings have uh, large openings and possibly curtains over those openings so you can partially close the building during extremely cold, windy weather. Uh, but some of the walls are typically left completely wide open. If there's any insulation at all in these buildings, it would just be to control condensation under the roof line. We're not trying to keep these buildings warm at all. This is a cold environment, uh, so we're not trying to hold any heat in these barns. Here's an example then of what we might see with a bedded beef building. This is in a hoop style structure, a fabric roof over the building, uh, 40 feet wide and 400 feet long up in northeast Iowa in Floyd County. And you can see they put a feed bunk all along one side of the building with the exception of uh, areas to let uh, gates in to move cattle in and out and to take bedding in and out of the building. 
Here's another example in northern Iowa where they had three of these buildings connected together. Uh, and again, when you look in that building, they had a center feed alley through the middle building of this arrangement. And then on the outside edges, they had feed bunk just along the outside edge of each of those outer two buildings. In this case, you can also see that they've stacked bedding bales along the west side of that feed bunk to provide a little more wind protection on that open side of the building. And they've also put an end wall kit in the north end of the building to provide some wind protection from the north, but the south end is wide open. Actually, if you look closely at this arrangement of buildings, they've got some open lot space between the buildings, and the cattle have access to that. So technically, this setup is not a confinement building. It's an open lot with structures. Um, you don't have to use hoop-style roof structures for these. A lot of these bedded buildings are going into monoslope steel buildings. Uh, some of them are what I would call double wide, where they put feed bunk on both sides of the pins. And in that case, the building is probably around 100 feet wide. Here's an example of one of those in Riceville in Iowa. And you can see a feed bunk along the south wall there. Uh, as you look at the front of that building, these are very tall when they get that wide. We're talking roughly 25 feet high at the south edge of this building. And then back at the back edge of the building on the north, roughly 12 feet high. And you can see most of that 12 feet is curtain space to allow good summertime ventilation through the building. Since this is a confinement building, they have to store the manure with no discharge allowed. So in this case, they put in an outside storage pad. Uh, the storage pad slopes away from the building to contain the water in the storage pad. And then there's a concrete wall all the way around the storage pad so that they can contain the manure even with rainfall added to it and store it outside the building. Here's another example over in Nebraska Dixon Feed Yard using a large monoslope building. And again, it's high on the front. Uh, but in this case, they decided to store the manure inside the building rather than outside. So they built some storage bays into the building. And I believe their intent is that they'll bring the manure from the pens from either side of this storage bay and just pile the manure up inside the building and keep it under the roof. Uh, that certainly minimizes the impact of rainfall on the manure storage and maybe a more economical way to store the manure in these bedded buildings. The building doesn't have to be 100 feet wide. There are some folks who build the monoslope roof and just put it over a 40 to 50 foot wide pen. Here's an example uh, again in north central Iowa uh, where they have put uh, a 40 foot wide building over uh, the pens. Uh, in this case, as they put the roof out there to cover the feed bunk, they put translucent panels on that roof to allow some more sunlight to come through those panels into the pens. The back side of the building, again, is mostly curtain area to allow good cross ventilation through the building in the summertime. One more example of a monoslope building is up at the South Dakota State University Opportunities Farm. Again, this building is just uh, one pen wide, so the feed bunk is all along the south edge of the building. And as you look back inside the building, you can see their textured concrete floor. They've got some bedding uh, pack in the back of the pens and their water supply back there uh, up toward the front of the pens. They scrape it more frequently near the feed bunk. Looking at approximate costs for these types of structures, uh, slatted floor confinement buildings have run in the past uh, between six and seven hundred dollars per headspace. These solid floor confinement buildings are slightly cheaper to build because you don't have the storage pit built underneath your floor. Uh, I would say 450 to 550 is a good estimate on the cost of building these structures. Occasionally, you'll hear quotes as low as 220 per head space, but I think you will find that those just aren't including all the bits and pieces that you would need for the building. Uh, maybe an unfair comparison when you hear those types of quotes. Uh, this is in comparison to open earthen lots with a shed. Uh, which would be similarly priced uh, in that 450 to $550, $575 range. Uh, and earthen lots without buildings, just having a windbreak in the earthen lots, much cheaper at about $175 to $300 per head space. If you look at the land requirements, there's a significant difference here. Also, if you're talking about just earthen lots, you're looking at around 10 acres required per 1,000 head. Uh, if you concrete the lot, put them on a much smaller space, you could get that down to about 3 acres per head. But with the confinement buildings, you'll be under 2 acres per 1,000 head. 
Uh, so if land space is a big problem, uh, it might be worth considering these confinement buildings. Looking at the nutrient management side, uh, all systems over a thousand head are going to require nutrient management plans. And in Iowa, confinement systems over 500 head for beef will require a manure management plan. If you look at the amount of nutrients we're collecting here, slotted floor confinement, of course, would give you the highest retention of nutrients, uh, about 95 pounds of nitrogen per head space per year, uh, or roughly enough to uh, fertilize a third to half an acre of crop per head space. Uh, Phosphorus, you'd have about 60 pounds of P2O5 equivalent per head space per year, or roughly enough to fertilize one acre of crop ground. When we look at the bedded buildings, uh, it's much harder to uh, estimate the amount of manure. Uh, you're going to have roughly the same nutrients dropped in the building, plus a little bit of nitrogen and phosphorus added in the bedding. Uh, there will be some nitrogen loss to the air as ammonia, although the amount there is probably not huge. Uh, so I would say in general, they're going to require just somewhat less land for nitrogen application, depending on uh, how you store the manure uh, and how much nitrogen loss there is, and roughly the same amount of land application area for phosphorus as what a slotted floor building would. However, uh, everybody wants to know, well, what's the N, P, and K nutrient content per ton of manure, or how many tons of manure per headspace am I going to haul? Uh, and I'm not going to give an answer to that, because I know I would be wrong. Uh, there's tremendous variability in the moisture content of the manure coming out of a bedded packed building. I think the nutrient content there, the pounds of nutrients in the building, is fairly predictable, but the amount of water that you're hauling back out of the building is not predictable. So trying to predict nutrient concentration or total tons of manure hauled out of the buildings is proven to be very, very difficult. Uh, another note on nutrients, just keep in mind that if you're feeding phosphorus uh, in ethanol co-products, that's going to increase the phosphorus content of your diet and of your manure. Uh, and the amount of increase there uh, can be easily as much as 20 to 40 percent. And uh, folks at the University of Nebraska say possibly even as much as 90 percent if you're using the wet distillers, grains, and solubles. Uh, so keep that in mind on your nutrient management. Um, just a precision disclaimer here, I'm giving you some rough numbers here, but certainly for planning purposes, you would want to uh, work with a consultant on nutrient management and costs of the building uh, to get more precise numbers for your planning purposes. I'd like to show you just briefly a confinement comparison that we've done at the Armstrong Farm here in southwest Iowa. Uh, we did a partial concrete bedded hoop building. Uh, it's a 40 head pens for comparison with another facility. We compost our manure bedding mix out of that building and then compare it to an open lot with shed uh, for cattle performance, labor costs, and things like that. And here's our site. We had an existing feedlot already on the site uh, with the shed in the open lot. There was a flat area outside that building to the northwest, so we put our hoop building out there and connected it with a feed alley to the existing driveway structure on the farm. Uh, we used the rest of that flat area as composting area for the manure bedding mix and put a settling terrace around that to make sure we didn't have uh, manure moving away from the site. We connected the two buildings together with a sorting alley so we didn't have to duplicate the costs of working facilities. Uh, looking at a plan view for the building, uh, again, it's 120 feet long, so it's a 120 head capacity building, 50 feet wide, and we had the fence line feed bunk on the east side of the building. There's 20 feet of concrete right next to the feed bunk, uh, an apron there, and uh, the gates can be open so you can clean all the way through the building uh, without having to work in the small 40 foot wide pens. The cattle are moved out of the building into a holding alley just west of the building while we're cleaning the pens and adding bedding so they can be moved out of the way in those small pens. Looking at a cross section of the building, again, 50 feet wide. It's on 10 foot side walls in this case, which makes it about 26 feet uh, high to the peak. We have a tongue and groove wood liner on the west wall of the building and the feed bunk again on the east wall of the building. There's an awning out over the feed bunk to protect the feed bunk from rainwater and then the concrete apron that slopes away from the feed bunk the first 10 feet. And the back of that floor then is geotextile fabric with limestone screenings on top. Uh, this is crushed limestone that's too coarse to be sold as ag lime and too fine to be sold as road rock. Uh, so that's the way our building is laid out. 
Uh, this is our comparison facility then. Uh, has 25 square feet under roof per head and 125 square feet 125 square feet of earthen lot per head. The bedded hoop building there is in the background. There's a little shot inside our comparison structure. It has the inside feed alley. Uh, we had an outside feed alley on our bedded building and just rocked the feed alley out there along the feed bunk. Uh, there's a shot of putting that limestone screenings flooring material in the back of the pens over top of the geotextile fabric. So a shot of the completed building. Um, we did uh, want some wind protection for the cattle in that building since the building sits north and south and we decided rather than putting an end wall in the building we would try just using bedding bales as a wind break that has worked well enough uh, that our manager does that at both ends of the building to protect from north and from south winds in the building and that has worked quite well we haven't found it necessary to put the end wall kit in the building See, gonna have to jump out here to get to the next slide. There we go. Uh, what I would consider keys to bedded beef confinement success. Uh, first one is just bedding, bedding, more bedding. Uh, bedding is the only thing you have to absorb the moisture from the manure in this case, uh, so there's no substitute for bedding. We use five to six pounds of bedding per head per day through our facility, and there isn't much difference between winter and summer. Uh, it makes sense when you think that the bedding is there to absorb urine, and the urine production isn't going to be any lower in the summer. If anything, it may be slightly higher in the summer. We clean the apron near the bunk frequently, uh, about weekly, sometimes as, as often as every four days, depending on the condition in there. The remaining bedding pack in the back of the pens can stay longer. In our case, we leave it in for the entire turn of cattle, roughly 100 to 120 days. Uh, I would say the key here is just check your pens daily and add bedding as necessary. Airflow and humidity can affect the evaporation out of those pens and uh, will affect your bedding requirements. Uh, we find that we have to bed more frequently in humid weather than we do in drier weather. And I would say size matters. Uh, the tighter you squeeze the animals into that space, the harder it's going to be to do good bedding management. We have 50 square feet in our building, makes it relatively easy. I think if you squeezed much tighter than 40 square feet per head, it would be more and more difficult to manage that bedding. So you do need to plan for a large supply of bedding and storage for your bedding to make these bedded buildings work. Another key to success is good ventilation. Uh, the buildings provide wind protection, but they're not enclosed typically. They may have curtains or bedding bales to act as a wind break to provide protection from direct winds, but we want to keep those buildings as open as possible to allow good ventilation to remove moisture from the buildings. Uh, especially in the summertime uh, to alleviate heat stress, we want to make sure we can open that building up as much as possible, and I think it's key to orient your building for good summer airflow through the building. I think you want to make good use of sun and shade in these buildings. I would say high open sides to the south makes sense. It gives you shade in the summer and also allows good sun penetration in the winter back into the building. I think you also want to keep in mind though that you want to maximize your summer shade and uh, remember the east and west sun too, not uh, just the sun from directly overhead. And I think building durability where it matters makes sense with these bedded buildings. A uh, concrete apron along the feed bunk is absolutely essential. I don't think you could do without that. A full concrete floor I think would be best. Uh, we are having good success with our partial concrete floor, uh, but certainly it's not as good as full concrete and may not meet rules in some cases. If total containment of the manure is required from the building, it's possible that something like a stone floor surface such as the one we have may not be considered total containment in the long run. Uh, if you're going to have anybody like me in there running a loader, you'd want concrete up at least four feet in that loader zone. I would tear anything else up uh, if you let me loose in there with a loader. You want to make sure you manage the roof water off of these buildings, uh, gutter the water away from your feed bunk. That's uh, relatively easy to do with a wood or steel uh, framing and a steel roof. It's much more difficult to do with fabric awnings. can be done, but it's certainly more difficult. Uh, you might consider making the building slightly wider and putting the feed alley on the inside. That gets you away from some of those roof water management issues. And do keep in mind on the large monoslope buildings, there's enough roof uh, surface up there 
neighborhood that the rainwater coming off the back of the building is significant amounts and you may want to even gutter the back of the building so that water isn't blowing back in through your open wall. And I'd say think about movement details is another key. Animal movement uh, for sorting and working the cattle, for moving them out of the way while you're cleaning and bedding the building is important. Also think about manure movement into and out of the storage structure that you have, uh, minimizing your labor requirements here for moving animals and moving bedding and moving manure will help uh, with the cost effectiveness of these systems in the long run. So the question, will it work in uh, bedded confinement? Uh, clearly the answer is yes. Uh, comparison studies here at our farm at ISU and at the uh, Opportunities Farm at South Dakota State University both show that average daily gain in feed efficiency in the bedded buildings is equal to the best of the outside feedlots with partial confinement buildings. Uh, so uh, it, I think we'll, we'll probably beat an average open lot and will equal, will equal the performance out of the best of the open lots. Uh, manure value is better coming out of these bedded buildings than it is off of open lots, so you're maximizing your return back from that manure also. And there are some distinct environmental advantages for some locations uh, through greatly reduced or even eliminated runoff from the site, low odor and solid manure that sometimes is easier to manage. Additional resources, if you'd like more information on the costs of these structures, the Beef Feedlot Systems Manual gives uh, good background information, and the South Dakota State University Opportunities Farm comparison is on the web at opportunitiesfarm.com. You can read more and see more photos of their comparison. And I think that's about all I've got, Rick. <laughs>